Hi there, welcome. Uh, do we want to leave Kirsten up here or should I move on? I move on. <laughs> All right, so I think the idea here was that I was supposed to give a, a different perspective coming from an engineering background. Um, I really think I'm going to say about the same thing. And Paul probably said it much more eloquently. Um, but I'll give it a shot here. Okay. How many of you are anxious about your major? Anyone? Are people asking you? See some hands go up. I remember being anxious. Um, you don't have to choose until you're a sophomore here is the good news. And I don't think there's a wrong answer. So try to, try to relax about that. Easy for me to say, right? Um, so engineering at Dartmouth. I'm going to start with engineering since that's what I know. This is a quote um, from a 13, so a student that graduated a few years ago. Um, I won't read the whole thing to you, but his basic idea is he had a lot of broad interests. So he chose Dartmouth over a more traditional engineering school so that he could look at or touch on all of his interests. French, uh, what else? Outdoors, music, he had a broad range of interests. He was in two of my classes, great student. Um, he actually was on a team that had patented and invented a new football dummy as well. He has had, have people seen it? It's pretty cool, so you have to go watch football practice. Um, he has gone on. He has gone through two different careers. He's now working in Cambridge, very happy. He's working for a startup. He does quantitative analysis, um, and he uses his French because he's in charge of a lot of their European relations. So um, definitely one of our success stories. So liberal engineer is a term that's often used by the dean of engineering, so I stole that from him. Um, what he means is an engineer from a liberal arts college. So if you get an engineering degree here at Dartmouth, it's much different than a degree at a more standard four-year uh, or four-year non-liberal arts college. So, and I went to a state university, very traditional engineering degree. Um, you can do great things with those degrees, but like Paul said, it's very different, um, very information-based. Whereas here, it would be very liberal arts-based. Our focus is going to be very much into design thinking. Um, qualitative skills for sure, as well as um, quantitative. Uh, we do a lot of team-based projects. You have the option to study abroad. There's space in your curriculum to study abroad here if you do an engineering degree. Whereas in my traditional state school where there was this whole list of requirements I just had to go through one by one, I had no option to go study abroad or do foreign study. Um, so you just have a wealth of opportunities here. Lots of flexibility, too. You can make your major whatever it is. Now, I'm focusing on engineering, but I think all departments here could say that same thing. Tons of flexibility to make your own major. Our students major in engineering and minor in, minor in studio arts or double major in engineering and classics, and there's all sorts of combinations. Um, so I think that's one of the really fun parts. So Paul was great at stories. That's what he does. Um, I was trying to figure out how am I going to convince them that liberal arts is a great approach and it's a better way of learning. So instead of stories, I fell back on science. Um, so I'm going to show you a few different studies. I'm not going to go into the details. Teaching and learning is kind of my passion. So this is an image from a book by James Zoll. It combines education, psychology, and biology to try to explain how people learn and what the best ways are to learn and teach. So it's a great example right there of liberal arts coming together to explain different phenomena. So what he, this basic premise, and this is an image from the book, is that learning is going to happen in a lot of different ways. So you need to have a lot of different experiences to get deep learning. So you need to have uh, different modes, so verbal and hands-on, um, communicating, written, uh, lots of different experiences. And I think you get that from taking a whole range of courses. It's not just courses. There's lots of other things here at Dartmouth, and you're going to learn from those too. So that's just one study. This is an interesting study from Caltech and USC, basically saying the same thing, but they actually looked at brain imaging. So they were looking at images of the brain and correlating those with intelligence. Now we could argue about these intelligent tests um, whether they actually measure intelligence, but they gave students a broad range of these tests, and there was a very direct correlation between performance on that test and how much of the brain was being used. So using more, building more connections and using different parts of your brain resulted in higher intelligence. Or, okay, let's not say higher intelligence, better performance on those tests. This was a fun one, neuroscience of creativity. So in engineering, we talk a lot about creativity. I'd almost rather you came out of Dartmouth engineering as a creative, ready to get patents and try new ideas um, than having lots of information and being able to connect those dots. So this was a study that um, kind of debunked a lot of previous 
uh, right-left brain research. So they, they reinforce that there, is, there are differences versus when you're doing math, you're using more left brain versus right brain uh, for different tasks. But they also looked in this specific study at the creative process. So they looked at people who were doing creative things, and they also mapped their brain and looked at what parts of their brain they were using. And the most creative in individuals were using as much of the left brain as the right. Okay? So what this tells me to me is you can't just say, oh, I'm only a right brain person or I'm only a left brain person. You really have to use both sides. And this is the reason we have those quantitative classes. Okay? No, it's not the only reason. But there is a reason we should take those math classes, even if you're a classics major. Math is going to give you some quantitative reasoning, and I think in the end that's going to make you um, a stronger person, more creative, better, better to think through different things. I like this quote at the bottom, and Paul talked a lot about connecting the dots. So I think it's all just about connecting the dots of this wealth of information that you're getting, these skills. How are you putting them together? Okay? Trying to collect as many of those experiences as possible. This is a fun kind of small study, but it looked at scientists specifically and scientists who had won major awards. So the Nobel Prize, National Academy of Science, and the Royal Society were three that I pulled out. And they looked at their, whether they had an art avocation. And they had lots of rules on what quant qualified as an art avocation, and then they uh, compared that to scientists in the public. They only looked at the US. Um, but you see there's a big difference. So scientists in the US who haven't won an award only noted that they had an arts avocation, 35% of them did, as opposed to Nobel Prize winners were over 90%. And that was really significant to me. This study just looked at arts, but similar things came out of looking at language and different interests. So it turns out if you want to be a better scientist, it is great to have a broad range of interests, not just be so narrow and only know every technical detail. At least that's what I took out of this study. This is a couple examples from that study, famous examples. Um, older examples, but famous nonetheless. So uh, George Washington Carver, who was a botanist and also a famous painter, and Dorothy Hodgkin, who was a bot chemist. I would refer to her as a chemist and also an accomplished artist. So showing that you can have those combinations. It goes the other way, too, accomplished artists who are great in science and other fields. So a few on the engineering successes, just because that's what I know. And, the, and actually, um, William Kumquaba, anyone? read his book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind? No? OK, everyone, that's your first assigned reading. Go out and read that. Um, it's from Africa. Uh, he was an engineer before he came to Dartmouth, I would say, because he constructed his own windmill um, and lots of other things. He was a, t a tinkerer and a learner. He would go to the library and learn lots of different things. So he graduated in 14. Um, and has gone on to do TED Talks and write books and have been very successful. He was actually an environmental studies major um, with a minor in engineering. Some of our other excesses, ex successes, I feel like this is kind of a weird sound, but I don't know, sorry. Um, gyro bike is one of the older ones. So gyro bike is a, is a wheel that you put on the front of a bicycle. My daughter learned to ride a bicycle using a gyro wheel. So it's a replacement for training wheels. So training wheels, you kind of wobble back and forth. And this is a class project that ended up, they ended up patenting it. Um, the, the wheel on the front spins really fast and holds the bike up. Okay? Now, they didn't just use engineering and technical skills there. They had to spend lots of time watching little kids ride bikes to see what their problem was and looking at the human relationships. And the people on their team were not only engineers. There were people from education and psychology and other departments that worked on this project originally. Um, a team of four actually took it all the way through school and started a company. I think it's a great example of bringing all these different pieces together, not just technical. Um, Trey Bien, so Shinri and Chris, Christina are both still here. They're 16s, I believe. Um, in Engines 21 and Introduction to Design, they invented this new tray. It's really quite simple. It's laser cut and it's a tray. But again, they had to look at how, how waitresses and bartenders and people were using trays. Um, and they came up with a great new way. And they've started a company. And they're already making money. And they haven't even graduated. Okay? Puts me to shame, kind of. Um, I already talked about the tackle dummy, so that's in action. That was a football player and a rugby player are the ones that are kind of carrying it forward. Um, but they brought their interests together. It was a project that they started in their senior year. They have since graduated, but they're on campus testing and still refining their prototype. Um, and you can go out in the field and see the tackle dummy. So it's a dummy that moves around the field and can be tackled, so you reduce concussions. And they've done a lot of research neuroscience-wise, understanding how people 
play football, um, and how, how this dummy should move. Um, and Andrew, the quote at the beginning, he worked on this project too. He opted not to move forward with it as a company because he had other options, but he, he definitely helped in the beginning. Luminade is a nice one, um, a former engineering student who then went on to Columbia, and she was interested in re relief efforts in Haiti, so she came up with this solar, very easy, packable solar light. Um, but now it's being used by backpackers, and she's got a company, and she was on Shark Tank, and they're being very successful. Again, uses lots of different things. The technical details on that light are not very difficult, but putting together that whole business plan um, and working with people is what, what made the difference. So just a few successes. So see, these four have succeeded, and here's more that have succeeded. You guys can succeed, too. So opportunities at Dartmouth, there's not just your courses. That, to me, is a small part. Um, you, whether you want to do global, so this is uh, humanitarian engineering, we have a group and they're not just engineers. They go to work in Rwanda, Tanzania, Haiti, different places to help people. Um, Dartmouth Airs, two of the people in that group, that was the group that uh, won lots of awards, two of them were engineers, but at least four of them took engineering classes, even though they didn't men major in engineering. I'm sure that's why they were so good. No? Um, play soccer, do research, tons of opportunities. It's almost hard to pick which opportunities you want to you wanna focus on, um, but you have a breadth of opportunities, and I encourage you to take advantage. So Paul talks a lot about information versus skills. I usually talk about information versus deep learning and creativity, but the same idea. And so there's two different approaches. I feel like you can collect a lot of information. So if you're at a four-year four school, you're going to collect a lot of information. It's going to be all in basically one area with maybe a few other outside areas. So my engineering degree, I, one worry I hear from students is, well, if I do engineering here at a liberal arts college versus a standard college, I'm not going to take as many classes. Um, and I took lots of classes. I remember my brother making fun of me. He was at a liberal arts college, and I was taking engineering, but I was taking concrete design and steel design and wood design and multiple of those classes. Lots and lots of details, which is all out of date now, and I haven't really used. Whereas here, you're going to take a materials class and understand how to think about materials, and that's going to be, make the world a difference. You can adapt to all those different details later on. Um, so lots of information. You're going to gather lots of information, too. What I encourage you to do with that information is to collect that information in as many different areas as possible. So if you're a classics major, take some engineering classes, take some math classes, take some foreign language classes, um, learn about culture. It's all going to help you become a better critical thinker. But in addition to collecting that, those different pockets of information, I think the key is trying to connect them all. So that means not just sitting in that math class saying, oh, I've got to take this math class and check it off. It means actually trying to figure out how that fits in to your other classes and how you can make the most of it. Um, and that, that's where I think you'll be really successful. Um, I don't think you should all be engineers. I hope the dean doesn't hear me say that. Okay? I see students come to engineering thinking, oh, I'm going to go to engineering because my mom says or my dad says or it's maybe more practical. And they don't thrive because they're not excited about it. If you're excited about it, I want you there. Um, and I think you should all take at least one class. Okay? So tomorrow when you or Monday when you sign up, all sign up for an engineering class? No? Okay. I'm kidding on that. You don't have to all sign up for an engineering class, but experiment with different things. Um, the beauty of being at this type of liberal arts school is you get to experiment. So use this first year. There might be majors out there you don't even know about, jobs you don't even know about. Um, so try to experiment with different things. 